Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started in just a few seconds here. If I could ask you to please have a seat or carry the conversations outside. Thank you, Ernie. There's some seats up front if uh, the crowd standing in the back wants to move in this direction. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is David Edelman. I'm the United States uh, Ambassador uh, in Singapore. And uh, what a, a privilege and honor it is to be a part of this uh, magnificent program. Uh, John, Ernie, and the CSIS staff, thank you very much. Um, for topping off what has been a Singapore week here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we have a, a, an excellent um, keynote speaker and panel presentation uh, on a very important uh, component of the multifaceted U.S.-Singapore uh, relationship. Uh, and if I could, I'd like to just for a moment put this uh, in context then we'll remind you of uh, the rules, and I'll introduce uh, our keynote speaker, the Minister of Education from Singapore. As you've heard uh, throughout most of uh, today, uh, U.S.-Singapore relations are really at an all-time high. Uh, things have never uh, been better. And of course, uh, as the immediately preceding panel discussed, the historic foundation of the bilateral relationship uh, has been security and the um, extraordinary military to military cooperation uh, continues. An earlier uh, panel covered a trade and investment where uh, the free trade agreement that's going on 10 years now has governed a very high performing, uh, productive uh, uh, commercial relationship between uh, both countries. Uh, and then there's, of course, uh, the third pillar uh, of the relationship. And in our embassy, uh, it has been our goal to institutionalize or begin to regularize the other parts of the relationship, not covered by the Strategic Framework Agreement for Defense, nor by the Free Trade Agreement for Trade and Commerce. And I am delighted uh, to be here um, this week, uh, where we launched the strategic partnership dialogue earlier in the week with the foreign minister and Secretary Clinton, which begins to do just that, institutionalize the other parts of this multifaceted bilateral relationship. And there's no issue more important uh, to uh, the continued growth and deepening of the bilateral relationship than education and the potential uh, cooperation on education at all levels. Now, before I introduce the keynote speaker, just a reminder, uh, Mr. Minister, your comments are on the record, and I'm told even uh, the question and answer session with the keynote uh, is on the record. When we move to the panel presentation, it's uh, Chatham House uh, rules uh, will apply. So without um, any, any uh, further uh, administrative business, uh, it's my honor to introduce today's keynote. You know, we've heard earlier today about um, the extraordinary competence uh, public administrators in Singapore uh, display. So it's truly remarkable, I think, when we have uh, a public administrator, and in this case, uh, the Minister of Education, from Singapore who really indeed stands out amongst a truly uh, distinguished group. Our Minister of Education came to this portfolio less than a year ago in the middle of 2011, but he's not uh, new to many people in this room and he's certainly not new to the service of his country, Singapore. Previously, he had been the managing director of the Monetary Authority of Singapore and really distinguished himself as one of uh, the truly uh, great talents in central banking uh, for Singapore. And he continues, uh, as is uh, often the case, um, with cabinet level officials in Singapore to wear multiple hats and continues his service, uh, not as the managing director, but continues to serve at the MAS. He had also previously been uh, the PermSec at the Ministry of Trade and Industry, um, the CEO of the Trade Development Board, 
uh, and had served as the principal private secretary to then senior minister uh, Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, Hang Sui Kiat uh, is an extraordinary uh, public servant. He has degrees from uh, Cambridge and Harvard, and I could not be uh, more delighted that he is taking on uh, the uh, very important aspect of U.S.-Singapore bilateral relations covering education at all levels. So please join me in welcoming uh, the Minister of Education from Singapore, Hang Sui Kat. Well, thank you, David, for, for your introduction and for your very kind remarks. It's a great pleasure to be here. Welcome to the education segments today. And uh, I'm very pleased to have signed the MOU with Secretary Duncan yesterday and to have visited the Department of Education. There will be many areas of collaboration between Singapore and the US. You have many peaks of excellence which we admire and which we learn from. Coming to this lecture reminds me of a story about Professor Albert Einstein, who was on a tour of the campus in the US and he went to so many of them, he gave the same lecture in every campus, and his driver said, Professor Einstein, can I do this on your behalf this time? I remember every word you said. <laughs> so he did. What he didn't know was that there was a Q&A which was on record. <laughs> so the first question came, and he said, well, that's, that's all right, you know, same question. So he answered word for word what Professor Einstein had said. Same second question came, he did the same. Now the third question was a really hard one. And the driver who was impersonating as Professor Einstein said, gee, this is such a simple question. Even my driver can answer it. <laughs> so if you ask me a very simple question later, I'm going to turn you to the real experts, the four ladies seated in front, and I'm delighted to have them with, with us, uh, Joanne Weiss, uh, Professor Linda Darling-Hammond, uh, Jess Jessica Kehes, and uh, Ching Yi. Now, um, the theme of this segment is education for competitiveness and growth. But let me start with sort of three caveats, which is first, education really has multiple roles. Fundamentally, it's about developing the unique individual, uh, helping him or her to realize his or her aspirations and develop his or her full potential. Second, education basically helps us to appreciate our roles and responsibilities as members of a community as a member of our nation, as a member of a global community. And third, education is an important pillar for the economies, but we need a range of macroeconomic, microeconomic, structural policies, trade policy, labor policies, and so on, to make the economy competitive. But having said that, let me say that indeed, uh, education is critical to our future and to our competitiveness and growth. I think the concerns after the financial crisis over the lost generations of, particularly of youth unemployment, I think drives home this message uh, very clearly. So it's very important for us to get ourselves into a virtuous cycle where a good education system support economic growth and competitiveness so as to allow us to fulfill the aspirations of our people. And in turn, that growth allows us to continue to invest in education. Now, let me briefly share uh, our history of education reforms in Singapore and our old experience. We have a very short history, less than 50 years as an independent nation, but we have gone through uh, several major phases of education reforms. Now, the first part, just after self-government, was a phase of basically survival of the, of the nation, of the country. And the focus was on basic education, getting every student into school, and getting everyone to have some basic literacy so as to fill labor-intensive jobs. Now, in the second phase, by the late 70s to about 1996, industrialization in Singapore has basically taken off, and the uh, focus was on building a whole range of engineering, vocational, and technical skills and to reduce wastage in education, so through uh, streaming, through ability-based learning, and so on. And the third phase was from late 1990s, after, during the Asian financial crisis, where we, we know that 
the economic structure has to change. We have to shift towards a knowledge-based economy. And that's where we moved education into an abilities-based, aspiration-driven phase. Now, I want to draw a few important lessons from this short history. First is that for us, as a small economy, we have to stay open to the rest of the world in order to remain relevant. But staying open also means that we are subject to the massive forces of globalization. And therefore, we have to keep reinventing the economy uh, every few years in order to stay relevant. Second, as a country with no natural resources whatsoever, it is important for us to develop our only resource, which is human resources. So uh, the broad message is we take education very seriously because it's critical to our survival and success, because it's critical to the future of our nation. Now, I mentioned about the future. question is, what would the future bring? Because education must prepare us for the future. I think we don't know what it will bring, but what we do know is that the change will be even more intensive and more pervasive, driven by a range of forces, accelerating rates of technological changes, globalization. We had a whole morning's discussion on trade and how that is going to drive globalization. A shifting economic weights, particularly if emerging markets becoming more important, as you heard this morning. Uh, volatility in the global financial and uh, eco global financial markets and in the economy. Pressure on resources, and all these concerns about global warming, climate change. Uh, if you look at many of the straight line projections on economic growth, it basically requires two planet worth of. Uh, to provide all the resources we need to sustain that growth. So pressure on resources will be intense. And of course, demographic changes in various parts of the world and rising aspirations. All this will drive a range of uh, strategic, you know, changes in strategic relations as well as economic structures. And we can't tell in 20 years, 30 years time, when our students will be at the prime of their working age, what that future will look. So let me just hazard sort of three guesses on the implications on education. First, that economic structures are likely to be more differentiated, more complex, requiring a range of different skill sets and requiring interdisciplinary approaches to many of the problems that we, we face. Second, because the economy is more differentiated, we're likely to need talents in many shapes and sizes, each requiring every individual to be developed to their full, and third, because the rate of change is going to be so much faster, we've got to get back to fundamentals. And what are the strong fundamentals uh, where they will allow our people to have the desire and skills to upgrade continuously? Let me just share an example from Singapore in just 20 years. Now, the red line shows that in 1991, the, th the three jobs with the uh, highest with the lowest uh, percentage of workers were managers, professionals, and associates, the first three categories on the left-hand side of the chart. In 20 years, by, 19, by 2010, the three jobs with the highest percentage of workers were managers, professionals, and associates. So the job profile have completely switched in just 20 years. Now, when we look at the kind of economy that's, uh, that's developing, you'll find that, for instance, the lines between manufacturing and services are blurring. Rolls-Royce today sells hours of engine power, not number of engines. And within the services sector, let me show another chart that shows this massive change. The right-hand chart shows traditional services wholesale, transport, and storage. And these are OECD data, so this is basically very global. And it shows how, as income rises, the percentage share of GDP goes down. So the sort of simple wholesale trade, transport, and storage have become less important in the economy. Conversely, if you look at the left-hand chart, the modern services in OECD countries, financial business, infocoms, have risen in importance. And you see the changes in the GDP numbers. Uh, let me move on to another part of it. 
which is how economies have changed. I believe that the fiscal economy involved in manufacturing goods and services, uh, goods to satisfy human needs and want will remain important. But increasingly, over the fiscal economy, it's a knowledge economy that harnesses knowledge and uses knowledge to create, uh, to meet human needs and wants. Sitting over a fiscal economy is a huge digital economy that manages everything we do. Today, when we go to the airports and we check in, it's so highly automated that it is the digital part of it that is processing all the entry, that's issuing the air tickets, that's doing all the checking, and so on and so forth. And some analysts have even said that the digital economy will be twice the size of the fiscal economy over time, given the, if given the advances in IT. And overlaying that is an experience economy. It's no longer enough to sell fiscal goods. So Mr. Steve Jobs sell, sold not an iPhone, but he sold an experience, an experience of using that. And we'll see this played out in many different themes in the way that economies are going to evolve. So if you look at, again, another example of the Human Genome Project, this, when it started in 1990, it took 13 years and nearly $4 billion to complete. Just last month, a private company in California announced a machine that will map the entire human genome for $1,000 in one day. Now, then look at the number of zeros and the number of days. So the implication of this is quite astounding. Now, the, the bad news is that jobs do not have such clearly, will not have such clearly defined boundaries and skills as even 20 years ago. Good news is that the more complex and differentiated economic structures are, the greater the variety of jobs there will be, and they will require a wide range of skills. So let me now turn to, you know, thinking about the future, let me now turn to three ways that we hope to prepare students for the future. Now the first is, is that to prepare our students to access a new future, it is critical to have some notions of the variety and demands of, of the jobs of the future. The education system can then tailor the right skill sets for each individual. Not all jobs will require academic degrees. Indeed, in many areas, hands-on practical skills will be valued. But in whatever area, deep skills, high standards, and strong motivation will be needed. So 10 years of basic education is necessary, but not sufficient. Today in Singapore, over 95% of our students pursue, pursue post-secondary education, nearly 30% in the universities, over 40% in the polytechnics, and nearly 25% in the Institute of Technical Education, which has a very vocational slant. And many of them will progress be, beyond these first stages. Let me highlight that our consistent focus on industry-focused managerial, technical, and vocational skills has borne fruit. The courses in our polytechnics and the Institute of Technical Education are rigorous, with a strong focus on skills acquisitions, both generic thinking skills, problem-solving skills, and specialized technical skills. And, and we invest back. Uh, can you move back? Now, these are our Institute of Technical Education, which, are in, which has a very strong vocational orientation. But if you look at the facilities, uh, many have commented that this are equal to those in our universities, or, or even better, because these are newer. Next. Now, we have found this alignment with industry to be critical, and to ensure this, the boards of directors of these institutes are private sector industry practitioners. Uh, our lecturers in these institutes are expected to do projects, because that is the test of whether they, are, they remain relevant to the industry. And students are required to do industrial attachments. We also invest heavily in our polytechnics to ensure that the latest equipment in use in the industry is deployed for training. Now, to maximize flexibility at the system level, we seek to preserve a strong focus on science, technology, engineering, and maths. Because whatever the changes in the future, a basic and rigorous grasp of, of these subjects will equip our students well for change. Hence, in both the basic curricula and in the offer of post-secondary courses, we place strong emphasis on this. 
Now, for instance, in, in maths, all our students have to do maths till grade 10, and over half of them will do two maths subjects. All our students do at least one science subject at grade 10, and three in two will do two, and one in 10 will do all three, basically physics, chemistry, biology. And half of our courses in the university, and two thirds of our courses in the polytechnics and ITE, are science and technology courses. Now, at the same time, communication skills will be critical. For this reason, we place strong emphasis on learning English, the language of international business, and our mother tongues to connect our students to their heritage in Asia, and increasingly to multilingual communities globally. Every student in Singapore learns a second language, and those who are able learn a third language. And with Asia likely to grow, our bilingualism policy gives our students an added edge. Now, the second broad area that we're preparing our students is student centricity. To enable individuals to build knowledge and skills for the future, we need to design our education system centered on our students' aspirations and interests and integrate this within the broader system. So we've sought to create multiple pathways to turn different interests and strengths of individuals into a set of deep skills and competencies which are in demand in the markets. So this different pathway cater to all students and are well articulated throughout the system. We also seek to match the strengths and aptitudes of these students to help them achieve their potential. Now this does not mean that everyone will get to do the course of his choice because entry requirements, entry is competitive. But we, what we seek to do is to build bridges and ladders linking the different parts of the pathway so that success at one stage allows one to connect to the next stage so that there's no dead end as long as one strives. Now, education is also a key enabler of social mobility. We cannot guarantee equality of outcome, but we seek to provide equal opportunity. And this means ensuring no child is deprived of educational opportunities because of financial circumstances, more support for poorer families with children in school, preschool, investing in preschool for children, especially from a poorer background, and investing in levelling up programmes in primary school that attempt to level up academically weaker students in both English and maths so as to improve their foundations for future learning. Now, we have found that early intervention is important so that the student have a taste of success and have a confidence to continue. Now, the third area is basically to build fundamental values and skills. Now, this graph of changes in the information and a quote from Eric Schmidt that every two days now, we create as much information as we did from the dawn of civilizations up to 2003. Whether it's globalization, technological advances, or disruptive innovation, the nature of jobs and skills will change, often in unpredictable ways. I mean, 20 years, 20 years ago, we have not heard of mobile phones, or the, or, and when I started work, there was no computer. So however hard we try to maximize linkages with the industry today, we cannot predict what tomorrow will bring. So it's therefore critical for us to equip every student when they leave school with the basic knowledge and motivation to be lifelong and adaptable learners. So to help our students meet these challenges of the future and to acquire what we call 21st century competencies, we recently embarked on a values-driven, student-centric focus. Now what are these competencies? Now, at the core, the first two rings of our Swiss role are values and social emotional competencies. These are values that enable one to strive for success and to work with others meaningfully. And in an increasingly interconnected information rich world, the orange ring is important because our students need information and com communication skills, critical and inventive thinking, civic literacy global awareness, and cross-cultural skills. And our hope is that putting all this together, each child grows up as a confident person, a concerned citizen, an active contributor, and a self-directed learner. I believe many thought leaders in education, including in the US and Singapore, share many of these goals, and that's where one major area of our collaboration will be. Now, to support lifelong learning, we're also improving continuing education, and working with companies and industry 
to develop training programs to build skills for our workforce, so as to enable them to switch into new industries as our economic structure changed. In fact, Mr. Ong Yi Kang, who spoke earlier on, was in the Workforce Development Agency, driving many of these changes earlier. Now, I briefly outlined the challenges and some of the things that we are doing, but really good intentions are not enough. For everything we want to do, it must be translated into action and results. And there are two key ingredients to do this. One is the clarity and steadfastness of policy, and second, fidelity in implementations. Now, first, policymakers must be clear about the core principles and reasons behind their decisions and be steadfast in adhering to them. So we have to be flexible in terms of how it's actually delivered, give it time to show results, but make sure that we stay on course. And second, fidelity of implementation is key. And this means that all parts of the system must support the intended policy, ranging from soft systemic infrastructure in terms of teachers, school leaders, school networks, to hard infrastructure. Now, let me say a few words on this. First, educators. Now, educators in our school remain key to the delivery of outcomes. No system of education can be better than its teachers. So we continue to recruit quality educators and strengthen the quality of the pre-service training. We seek to recruit from the top one-third of every cohort of students to be teachers. But it's not enough to recruit well, because we must also continuously improve the craft of in-service educators, and really teaching is a craft. Second on our school leaders, school leaders shape the tone of the school, they set the direction, and we must systematically identify school leaders from among educators and provide professional development and leadership courses and early exposure to leadership roles so that they can gain experience and credibility. So we particularly welcome the partnership of Singapore's National Institute of Education with Columbia University's Teacher College to, to launch a joint Masters in Leadership and Educational Change. In fact, the official launch has just occurred in Singapore, and this, I hope, will benefit both the US and Singapore. We also have a school network where superintendents provide guidance and mentorship to principals in a given cluster so that policies can be contextualized and implemented in each of the schools in line with the policy intent. And also a bottom-up process where schools have more autonomy now to pilot innovations within their school. And of course, you know, infrastructure to ensure that whether it is indoor sports hall, performing arts studio, synthetic turf and so on, to allow us to carry this. Let me say a word particularly about parents because really parents play a critical role in educating their children by reinforcing the lessons learned in school and inculcating life skills. So we have a partnership program with community and partners in support of schools. And the basis of this collaboration must be mutual respect and shared understanding of how we want to educate our children well. Now let me conclude by talking about international collaborations. Now, I believe there are common challenges that we can all address together, even though our context may be different. We have found our collaboration with countries around the world, especially with the US, to be very productive. Besides the collaboration between NIE and, our, and the Teachers College, uh, new institutions have been formed. Uh, Yale University is setting up liberal arts college together with the National University of Singapore, and MIT is working with us together with a Zhejiang University from China to set up the Singapore University of Technology and Design. We are also collaborating with the US, Australia, and Finland in a consortium working on the assessment and teaching of 21st century skills. So we are glad to have established many of these partnerships in the US and hope that many more will be established on the back of, this en of the enhanced MOU, which I signed yesterday with Secretary Duncan. One final word is that Singapore is a global city situated in the heart of Asia. We hope to play a role to promote global Asia collaborations. And as you hear this morning from the various sessions, whether it's in strategic relations or trade or education or the economy. And to support that, our universities all have programs to deepen our understanding of Asia 
and to serve as a bridge for global partnership. The Singapore University of Technology and Design is an interesting collaboration between Singapore, US and China in that it brings diverse disciplines of science and technology from MIT and design and bring the knowledge of business in China and entrepreneurship and bring together these two peaks of excellence in Singapore. And I hope to see many more of such collaborations. So in summary, Education is an important and noble endeavour. More than just shaping the future of each individual, we also shape the future of our nation. And no doubt, education must be adapted to our local context. But we must also have an eye firmly on the global driving forces and the future we expect. And because the future will be more volatile, we've changed more rapid than ever, education must prepare our children to access a new economic future and build for them fundamental values and skills that hopefully will last them for a lifetime. We also need to be student-centric in our delivery so that every child is able to realise his or her potential to the fullest, creating opportunities for all, regardless of the family background. And at the system level, we need to create multiple pathways and peaks of excellence relevant to industry needs and systemically aligned. And finally, we must always remember that Implementation is policy. So I'm glad that we're able to collaborate with the US, your thought leaders, your institutions, your frontline educators to, sh to shape our futures together. Thank you. Mr. Minister, we have um, uh, a few minutes for some questions if you're willing to, to take a few. Sure. Uh, first, thank you for that. Um, very informative and um, interesting speech, and uh, again, congratulations on signing uh, the important MOU, enhanced MOU, yesterday with Secretary Duncan. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, my eyes are not that good. You're gonna have to jump up and down uh, to get uh, our attention, and the only thing I'll ask uh, is if you would identify yourself and uh, any organizational affiliation uh, prior to asking the question. Go ahead. And I guess there's a microphone roaming around somewhere. We got one? Yes, sir. Kiao Loy, a retired educator. Uh, Minister, I want to commend you for making education uh, playing such an important role in the growth of Singapore. Uh, I hope you shared the one particular component of that with Secretary Duncan, which is uh, recruiting the top third of college graduating classes. I think that's very significant. Now, my, my question is, I've learned that um, liberal arts education is coming into the fore in your future curriculum. And I, I have a friend who is working from the National University of Singapore who is working closely with Yale to, you know, to uh, learn, maybe you learn some of the uh, basic components of starting it. And so I want to know uh, in some detail about how, what uh, components of liberal arts education uh, is going to go into it, and to what extent is that going to underlay the college or university education in Singapore? Well, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, once an educator, always an educator. <laughs> now, uh, let me first sort of preface it by saying that um, over the years, our universities have uh, been evolving. We, it used to be that the universities were very uh, highly specialized with kind of strict disciplinary silos. And in the last 10 years or so, the universities have all moved towards, I'll say, a more American uh, style with much broader offerings. So every student, for instance, in the a, in a first, second year in particular, will have um, a range of different courses that they have to take. Even for our A-levels, which was which is modeled after the US, uh, the UK A-levels, we have changed it quite a bit in that we require students to take one contrasting subject. And that is a way of building breadth across the system. So, so things have evolved, and the Liberal Arts College will be a very small uh, college that will provide a very similar Liberal Arts College education as in the US. The details are being worked through, and 
uh, is part of a way of catalyzing a broader education in the rest of our university system. Now, our approach towards developing the university is not um, to have sort of cookie cutter universities where one is like the others. Uh, although we don't have the luxury of size like the US where you can really have a huge diversity and that's a great strength, uh, we do seek to differentiate the universities in Singapore so they all have slightly different focus, slightly different um, emphasis. And so whether it is infusing an element of liberal arts in education or infusing a broader curriculum or in the case of the new Singapore University of Technology and Design, it, it is an approach uh, which allows MIT, Chesiang University and Singapore to basically design a university education from ground up, starting from what is it that we hope to produce in our graduates and then working backwards to see how we structure the first, second, third and fourth year of the education without the traditional silos of university faculties. So those are all the different things that, that we are doing. Yeah. Next question. This one right here. Uh, Imel Skoden, a retired U.S. Foreign Service officer, was ambassador in Brunei, but also DCM in Singapore, deputy chief of mission at the American embassy there. In the mid-90s, when you, your predecessors were, were just instituting the um, the turn to the last phase of education you spoke about. And at that time, we heard a lot from your, your predecessors at the ministry, Teo Chehan, others, about the need to encourage more creative, out of the box, even at times disruptive thinking among students. Uh, my question is, in the years since, are you comfortable with the progress that's been made in that regard, or do you think there still needs to be more to be done within your system? Thank you for the question. I, the, I, th I think there has been quite uh, good progress in those areas in terms of if you look at the way uh, questions are being set, for instance, and the way that uh, teachers are teaching this. Uh, and we're comfortable with the, the progress. As in all things, uh, it's always our belief that education is always a work in progress. We should always continue to do better. And that's why you know, some of this work that we are, we are doing uh, together with other countries with US, with Finland, on looking at how we can better measure uh, 21st century competencies, how we can better help our students to acquire these competencies. Uh, so those will be the new areas uh, that we'll be uh, working on. The overall progress, I think, has been, has been satisfactory in where we think that we are headed in the right direction. Yes, there's a, there's a question there in the center. And Rana Freiberg with LSI Consulting. Uh, thank you both, Mr. Ambassador and Mr. Minister, for uh, these past few minutes. It's been very interesting. Um, my question has to do with the region. Given the internationally recognized excellence of the Singaporean education <coughs> system, as well as the role, the, the leadership role that Singapore has played within ASEAN and will continue to play in a variety of different sectors, I'm wondering what role does Singapore see for itself in terms of bringing um, its own expertise in English language learning, English language training, vocational uh, education to other countries in the region that may have uh, the fewer resources and a, a great need going forward uh, in the coming decade. Right. Well, uh, thank you. The, in fact, we have, a, we have a long tradition of cooperating in, in ASEAN on these issues. The, one of the first, one of the first um, regional network to be set up was uh, CIMIO, Southeast Asia Ministers of Education Organizations. And that is a forum where many of the ministers in Southeast Asia and beyond come together to discuss how we can collaborate. We also uh, have this ASEAN ministers, ministers of Education meeting as part of this effort to integrate the countries of ASEAN. Uh, we recently had a meeting in Bali looking at what we can do together. In fact, there were a number of projects that we were working on. Uh, Singapore <coughs> volunteered to work on the English language project, for instance, 
And some of you may know that we have a regional English language centre, which was set up in Singapore with uh, support from the US many years ago. And the centre is still operating, training many of the English language teachers from the region. So uh, we have a very extensive collaboration and we, we learn a lot from our neighbours. So for instance, our students go on the overseas exchange program, they go to our neighbouring countries. As part of our effort to ensure that our students uh, learn uh, the culture and the, uh, the culture of the, other, of the other ASEAN countries, and as part of this effort to promote the ASEAN um, sense of identity. So there are quite a number of this, and if you're interested, if you look at the, some of the CMU and all that web and other websites, many of these initiatives are uh, quite nicely documented. Mr. Minister, I think we have time for only um, one more question. Yes. So. Uh, I would like to ask a question about the language policy, particularly the teaching of Chinese. Uh -huh. uh, I'm a Barbara Harvey, a retired foreign service officer. Yes. And 30 some years ago in Singapore, a book was published called Youth in the Army, uh -huh. and it <laughs> which talked about whether young ethnic Chinese Singaporeans could communicate with each other or whether they knew particular dialects and there was a big speak Mandarin campaign. Yes. I haven't followed what has happened then, but what is happening in terms of the bilingual education in Chinese? Yes. Well, the, uh, today the younger generation uh, don't speak dialect at all. Uh, my children can't speak dialect at all. They all speak Mandarin, and so do many other children of, of that generation. And I think the bilingual policy is um, certainly for each of the racial groups to learn is uh, their mother tongue. So the Malays learn Malay, the Tamils learn Tamil, and the Chinese learn Chinese. And uh, we're giving it... Uh, Mr. In fact, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew has just published a book on which he said was his most important book, uh, and it's entitled My Lifelong um, Challenge to Life on Bilingual Policy. And uh, he has just, uh, he felt that, you know, we need to uh, give it even greater emphasis to particularly at the preschool level. And he has raised funds for a bilingualism fund. And I think he's, he aims to raise uh, $100 million dollars I think we are almost there, and I'm chairing a committee to look at how we can uh, uh, promote the learning of bilingualism at our schools, and more importantly, before schools. Yeah. So I think it, today, many of our uh, students speak uh, both languages, and uh, we have moved on to that to have a bicultural program. Many of our students, for instance, have attachments to China and to the region. Uh, so as to practice the, the language and to learn the culture even more deeply. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking my friend, uh, Minister of Education, Aung Sui Kyi. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I can just ask everyone to uh, sit tight while our